Macaulay, and together with um, uh, Dr. Wendling, we do the Harry Potter Conference here at uh, Chester Hill College. And um, uh, we've, we've just finished our eighth year, and we've already sat down to start planning the ninth. Uh, we're getting a lot more attention to the Harry Potter Conference than we have in the past. Uh, we just got written up at, in the London Times, um, being recognized for the only college that's doing a serious conference on, on Harry Potter and J.K. Rowling. And our conference this year was um, the best ever. You know, as the uh, as the uh, the phenomenon, the Harry Potter phenomenon, seems to be waning a little bit as the movies get a little bit older. Um, but the Harry Potter phenomenon, relative to the books, only seems to be getting stronger as parents read them to their kids. And and so it's a very interesting separation that's occurring between the hysteria that happened um, during the 2000s and the the now it's much more kind of a, a Peter Pan kind of uh, Alice in Wonderland kind of uh, feeling that's going on now compared to the everybody was into it. But we found out during the conference that, and, and when I wrote the book, a lot of people would come up to me and said, I heard about your book. And I'm like, yeah, thanks. And uh, they said, I haven't read any of the books, but, uh, uh, but I, I hear it's great. You know? So apparently a lot of people watch the movies who didn't read the books. But now the people who are interested in Harry Potter are mostly the people who have read the books. And uh, so we're really getting a different uh, reaction at this point. Um, as I said, the, the conference this year, the, the, the presentations were the best we've ever had, the, the highest level of, of consistency in terms of the really uh, excellent thought that was going on. So uh, we didn't expect it and we're very, we're very happy about it. So, uh, just, so you, just in case you don't know, every year we have a lot of really cool PhDs who come and present essays in our conference, but we also have people with master's degrees, people who are undergraduates, uh, people who are high school students who present papers. And it's one of the things that's important to us, that everyone um, has a, if you think of a good idea and you can put it together for a 10 or 20 minute presentation, uh, you can submit it to harrypotterconference.com and uh, you can present it at, a, at an official academic conference. Um, if you're thinking of graduate school, it's a great thing to put on your resume, for example, that I presented at a, a conference and it's right here in your college. So um, we put a lot of effort and time into it. So. Uh, you can check out all past uh, all the past conference uh, programs at our website and, and all that. We're thinking of um, putting some of the, the talks online soon um, so that you can see some of them. All right, you ready? So this comes from, let's see, I forget which, it's called Moral Pract Practice is Messy. Um, this is uh, one of the chapters in the book, um, and it has to do with the room of requirement. This brings us to a discussion of one of the most achingly beautiful and empathetic images from Rowling's series, The Room of Hidden Things. As we've said, all children begin with external rules. At this stage, I'm simply trying to follow rules set down to me, for me, by others. And yet, even this can be challenging. Children will make mistake after mistake as they try to practice responding to external demands and conditions. This process then becomes magnificently exacerbated by the rise of my own individual conscience. Many young people are at a loss as to when to stand up to authority and when to acquiesce to it. Just as they are developing a skill at following rules, their own characters begin to inspire them to question these very rules and authorities. It is indeed an insult to adolescents to attribute all their awkward indecision and halting determinacy to so-called raging hormones. What is becoming clear, however, is just how muddled and chaotic this process can be. The very license that is granted to dressmakers and musicians to make mistakes without consequence is denied to the individual determining his or her own character. Responsibility cannot be practiced without transgressing the very responsibility. It is often under the weight and the cost of bad decisions that we come to discover how important it is to make good ones. But what do we do with the bad decisions? The room of requirement shows up at key, at key moments throughout the Harry Potter series. From the practice and training room for Dumbledore's army, through the staging area for the Battle of Hogwarts, the room of requirement plays an essential role in the progress of Rowling's plot. However, while the room of requirement has often provided strategic and practical equipment for those who have stood before it, Rowling makes sure it indicates that it has provided something else as well. Quote, Harry saw Professor Trelawney, this is a quote from the book, 
Sprawled upon the floor, her head covered in one of her many shawls, several sherry bottles lying beside her, one broken. She hiccuped loudly. Professor, were you trying to get into the room of requirement? What? She looked suddenly shifty. The, the room of requirement, repeated Harry. Were you trying to get in there? Well, I, well, I didn't. No students knew about... Well, not all of them do, said Harry. I will, said Professor Trelawney, drawing her shawls around her defensively and staring down at him with her vastly magnified eyes. I uh, wish to uh, deposit certain um, uh, personal items in the room. And she muttered something about nasty accusations. Right, said Harry, glancing down at the sherry bottles. I uh, walked into the room, said Professor Trelawney, and uh, I heard a voice which has uh, never happened to me before in all my years of hiding. I uh, I use in the room, I mean. We can see in this that the room is also used to hide things that people are ashamed of. We see in this passage that Professor Trelawney has been hiding sherry bottles for years and that she is facing nasty accusations from about them. Passages like this reveal that the room is used to hide things, particularly things that are of shameful that, that are shameful or embarrassing. Under this use, the room gets another name, the room of hidden things. In an extended interview called Harry Potter and Me, the Rowling, um, that Rowling gave to the BBC in December 2001, she said, unless you can really, 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 really remember what it felt like to be a child, you've really got no business writing for children. I remember so vividly what it felt like to be that age. As young people practicing the skill of making decisions for themselves, many, many shameful and embarrassing mistakes will be made along the way. For many of us, these adolescent mistakes are some of our most painful memories, and it is not surprising that we resist and suppress our memories of them. It almost feels like a blessing to allow some of them to recede in ever dimmer recollections until they're all but forgotten. If we are the kind of people who do, in fact, allow these memories to dim and fade, then we are not good candidates for writing about or for the adolescent age group. Rowling's description of the room of hidden things is a searing and insightful description of the stumbling and uncoordinated chaos of young free will. Her description of the room of hidden things offers the reader a painful, painfully accurate and yet also empathetic expression of the all too common panic and desperation of this age group. As Harry enters the room of hidden things, quote, he could not help but be overawed by what he was looking at. He was standing in a room the size of a cathedral, whose high windows were sending shafts of light down upon what looked like a city with towering walls, built of what Harry knew must be objects hidden by generations of Hogwarts inhabitants. There were alleyways and roads bordered by teetering piles of broken and damaged furniture, stowed away perhaps to hide the evidence of mishandled magic, or else hidden by castle-proud house elves. There, there were thousands and thousands of books, no doubt banned or graffitied or stolen. There were winged catapults and fanged frisbees, some still with enough life in them to hover half-heartedly over the mountains of other forbidden items. There were chipped bottles of congealed potions, hats, jewels, cloaks. There were what looked like dragon eggshells, cork bottles of whose contents still shimmered evilly, several rustling, store, rusting swords, and a heavy blood-stained axe. Harry hurried forward into one of the many alleyways between all this hidden treasure. He turned right past an enormous stuffed troll, ran on a short way, took a left at the broken vanishing cabinet in which Montague had got lost the previous year. Finally pausing beside a large cupboard that seemed to have had acid thrown at its blistered surface, he opened one of the cupboard's creaking doors. It had already been used as a hiding place for something in a cage that had long since died. Its skeleton had five legs. He stuffed the half-blood prince's book behind the cage and slammed the door. He paused for a moment, his heart thumping horribly, gazing around at the clutter, the guilty outcomes of a thousand banned experiments, the secrets of the countless souls who had sought refuge in the room. The first thing that we notice about the Room of Hidden Things is its awesome scale. It is the size of a cathedral with walls and alleyways that resemble a city. 
Rowling has taken pains to give her reader the impression of something incredibly vast. However, size is not the only thing that she's trying to convey. She's also trying to highlight the fact that each, <clears throat> that each and every inch of the place is covered with individual objects of shame, guilt, or embarrassment. In other words, the room of hidden things is at once both incredibly vast and minutely detailed. The room of hidden things has been available to receive objects for many generations. Each object within the room has been placed there one at a time. Every object in the room is a key piece in the story of one particular Hogwarts resident. Harry is there to leave behind his copy of the Half-Blood Prince's Potions book. The story surrounding this book is detailed and significant for both Harry and the reader. Every other object, therefore, indicates different stories of equal importance to specific individuals who left it there. Each small object in the room is a remnant or artifact from some other detailed and crucially important story. Rowling then juxtaposes the individuality and specificity of each object to the overwhelming size of the space and number of these objects. The immensity of this space and the incalculable number of objects permits us a glimpse of just how many flawed individuals have felt the need to come to the Room of Hidden Things before Harry had. The Room of Hidden Things is a place people go to in an attempt to either hide something or to get away with something. It is a place to go to without anybody watching. It is a place where people put things they don't want anyone else to know about. In short, it's about secrets being kept secret. The books there are banned and graffiti or stolen. There are, quote, mountains of forbidden items. There is, quote, a heavy bloodstained ax. The room of hidden things is not about modesty or modest privacy or the right to keep things to oneself. It is about the desire for concealment, born primarily of embarrassment, lawlessness, guilt, fear, or shame. If we can imagine that students enter this room looking over their shoulders and trying to be as invisible as possible. One of the most interesting and unsettling images from the above passage is the description of a five-legged skeleton inside of a cage. The five legs seem to suggest an ill-advised experiment on a living creature that in itself is disturbing. However, Rowling also gives the impression that the caged creature had been left in the room alive and had died there. This idea is even more disturbing. We must remember that Harry is there in part because of the recent use of the secta, Sectum Sempra spell, which tortured and nearly killed Draco Malfoy. The Room of Requirement echoes, echoed Ginny Weasley's use of, the, of Riddle's diary in Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets. Diaries are, after all, locked and hidden so as to keep secrets. However, there is something curious about the Room of Hidden Things. Its performance differs significantly from the more general description of the Room of Requirement. When Professor Dumbledore needed a bathroom, the room became filled with chamber pots and chamber pots alone. When Mr. Filch needed a custodial equipment, it became a custodian's closet filled only with the appropriate tools. Parentheses. This is, by the way, perhaps the one time we see Mr. Filch performing actual magic. When Harry needed the room to become a training ground for Dumbledore's army, it provided what he needs and leaves out everything from previous uses. Why is it then that when the room becomes the room of hidden things, that every hidden thing from the past is also there? When a student comes to hide something, he or she sees not just the space to hide his or her object, he or she sees also every other object that has ever been hidden in the room. By revealing all the other hidden things to each new hider, the room is doing something that it doesn't do at any other time. It is doing something that is not required. If all I want to do is hide something, there is no need to reveal the entire history of hidden things at Hogwarts to me. Revealing this immense cascade of hidden things to the eyes of each new entrant into the room is something that entrant doesn't require. So why would the room of requirement do something that is not required? Perhaps it is doing something that is required. As we've said, people between the ages of 11 and 17 are constantly trying to hide their mistakes. Let's return to Harry's use of the spell Sectum Sempra. Harry gets a spell from his potions book that once belonged to the mysterious half-blood prince. The prince's notes had been allowing Harry to ex excel in potions class for the entire year. 
Harry had come to trust the prince's notes would always produce benefits. In a very tight spot, Harry uses the spell without knowing what it would actually do. While this may seem overly reckless, we must remember that people of this age are constantly trying things for the first time without really knowing what the outcomes will be. In order to gain experiences, I simply must be prepared to give new things a decent shot. This process is necessary, but also inherently risky. This aspect of adolescence is one that is often conveniently forgotten or disregarded by adults. The five-legged skeleton in the room of hidden things is an echo of Harry's use of sectum sempra. In both cases, it seems that the risks weren't considered seriously enough. As Professor Lupin had demonstrated, we must eventually learn how to seriously consider the worst case scenario before it actually occurs. In particular, we must come to realize that hurting others is a risk that is often too great to be taken. Harry considers the possibility that sectum sempra may be too much only after it is too late. Quote, Sectum sempra, bellowed Harry from the floor, waving his wand wildly. Blood spurted from Malfoy's face and chest as though he had been slashed with an invisible sword. He staggered backward and collapsed onto the waterlogged floor with a great splash, his wand failing, the falling from his limp right hand. No, gasped Harry. Slipping and staggering, Harry got to his feet and plunged toward Malfoy, whose face now sh was shining scarlet, his white hands scrabbing, scrabbling at his blood-soaked chest. No, I, I didn't. Harry was still watching, horrified by what he had done, barely aware that he too was soaked in water and blood. Harry gapes at the wounds inflicted on Malfoy in shock. Why hadn't he considered the pos this possibility beforehand? While, risks, while taking risks is part of gaining experience, considering the worst possible outcome is an essential element to authentic responsibility. So when the risk is taken and the worst occurs, most of us will feel the desire to hide it. This is when things are brought to the room of hidden things. When I have underestimated the risks or simply done something stupid, I often desire to hide the evidence. As we've noted, I do this alone, looking over my shoulder and trying not to be seen. This is an inherent, inherently lonely enterprise. People enter the room of hidden things almost always privately and on the sly. The desire for secrecy, no matter how practical, breeds feelings of isolation. Further, I will often keep the secrets within myself even after I have left the condemning evidence tucked safely away. These inner secrets will also have the tendency to separate and isolate me from others. Even if I have safely hidden the evidence and gotten away with my negative act, I may be left wondering if I'm the only one who has ever done such a thing. Four paragraphs left. Such secrets can begin to lead me to think of myself as irredeemable, as an irredeemable person, even while I assume that most of those around me are not. I will often have no idea that nearly every other student will also have had good reason to want to hide things. So what does the room of hidden things provide? The room makes it inescapably clear that I am not alone in my desire to hire indiscretions and bad decisions. The room does not provide easy mercy or undeserved reassurance. It does not hug the student and tell them that everything is fine. It does, however, allow the student, who may be at his most lonely and isolated moment, to see that he is not, in fact, the only one. Unlike the room of requirement, which is different for every entrant, the Room of Hidden Things allows each new entrant to see everyone else's hidden things. An act of shameful secrecy can leave a person feeling exiled, separated, or marked. This can be exacerbated by dark and unfounded suspicion that he or she is alone regarding decisions that require such shameful and furtive secrecy. This can leave such a person feeling like he or she is, the, is one of the few really condemnable people. This isolation of self-condemnation can become a trap. However, the room of requirement in its function as a room of hidden things can allow me to see that these objects have been, in fact, hidden by generations of Hogwarts inhabitants, end quote. Not just me. 
The sheer volume of hidden things in this room offers the developing individual the assurance that furtive secrecy may actually be a common characteristic of most school-age people. In her description of the room of hidden things, and as overwhelming in both intricacy and scale, Rowling, Rowling is offering her young reader a form of mercy. Even as I enter the room in the utmost secrecy and isolation, I will not likely leave feeling feeling as such, for I will have come to realize that uncountable generations have come to the same room before me and for very similar reasons. The room does not offer easy or vicarious forgiveness for trusting the half-blood prince when I should have been thinking for myself or for leaving a live creature to die in a cage, but it does allow me to realize that I may, be the, I may not be the only one, not the only one under this condition. If I can realize that I'm not the only one, if I can realize that there are many who have been through this before me, then I may be able to believe that there may also be some hope for me. However, this is a very specific type of hope. When I realize that I am not the only one who has done this bad thing, this does not make what I personally did any better. The five-legged creature is still dead and Draco Malfoy was really stabbed. However, when I come to realize that my own decisions have led me to the need to hide things, I can also come to realize that I will have to, I will have to be the one who makes the commitment to change my decisions. The need to hide things is not a good feeling. If I don't like that feeling, then I have to avoid decisions that result in the need to hide things in the first place. The room of hidden things is therefore something of a confessional. It allows me to see that, while I may have done something I regret, there are many who have gone before me in the same situation. If others have come here and then were able to move on with their lives, then maybe, maybe I could too. The room allows me to see that if I am to begin to avoid this place, I myself will need to be the source of the change. I will have to begin to take more seriously all the potential outcomes of my decisions.